everybody. Hello. Hi. <laughs> My name is Christina Inge, and I head up marketing for OHO Interactive. We are a Harvard Square based web and user interface design firm. And I also um, am VP of social media for the American Marketing Association and vice chair of alliances for the IEEE ENET. So I manage a lot of blogs. And I gather so do probably a lot of you here in the audience. I'm here to talk about how do you manage the multi-voice blog. That is, how do you manage a blog that's not your own blog, but one that has your coworkers or the community that you manage all weighing in, and how do you keep that a manageable workload, and how do you maintain the level of quality as well? So first off, I'd like to talk a little bit about how multi-voice blogs are really growing. They're the majority of corporate blogs. Most corporate blogs, unless you're with a really small sole proprietorship, are going to have several people on staff blogging. Um, they're also really speeding up in their growth because of the growth in online communities. Most online communities have a blog component, and as a result, since it is a community-based blog, it's by nature multi-voice. And um, the whole progress of blogging in itself has been sped up by the move towards inbound content and social media marketing, all of which rely very heavily on blogs and which are sort of an insatiable maw demanding more and more content, this giant you know, mouth demanding more content to be fed into it. So as a result, there's more and more multi-voice blogging going on because there's just no one person who can blog incessantly for a large corporation or for a major community. Um, that said, there's an extent to which maybe relying on multi-voice is a little um, excessive. Everyone's supposed to blog nowadays. You're really just not a live human being unless you have your own blog and, or you're taking part in your corporate blog. But the reality is, especially if you're managing a corporate blog, that not everybody wants to blog, not everybody can blog, and let's be honest, not everybody should be blogging. Um, so how do you deal with those? How do you deal with the reluctant bloggers in your organization who you want to have blog? How do you deal with people who maybe are interested in blogging for your company but just don't know how and how do you deal with the people who um, frankly probably need to be muzzled how many people here are managing a blog for a corporation right now pretty large show of hands how many are managing an online community how many manage a blog that has guest writers or that is the blog of a group of people a lot of people. So all of you have probably got specific challenges and actually I'd like to open up by maybe have five people raise their hand and say what are like the top challenges you face managing a blog that's got multiple people writing it. Yes, over there. Uh, one of the challenges I have um, is a, uh, a member of organizations mm -hmm. Okay, so appropriate content from volunteer bloggers that's not self-serving, but that's what the audience wants. Anybody else? Yes. Here you go. Training all the people on the proper practices and how to... Pardon? <laughs> Training all the editors on how to input posts properly into the system. So technical CMS-related issues. How about it? Yes. Convincing writers that they don't have to have an all blog. It's okay to contribute and still have their voice. Okay, so ego. <laughs> Two more. Yes. People more used to the voice for print writing and not being able to adapt themselves to online or blogging style voice. Okay, so finding a, a voice that's appropriate to a blog for people who are more used to print. Yes. A lot of the uh, bloggers that I work with want the results of SEO, but then want to strike out all the search engine keyword terms in their blog posts. So failure to cooperate with SEO efforts. Okay. So a lot of different challenges in the room and how do you manage a blog that's got a bunch of contributors. And we're going to talk and hopefully solve some of those problems right now. Um, first, let's go over what I kind of think of as the three major buckets, um, the three major categories of multi-voice blog. The first one is the easiest to some extent. It's the editorial blog, and that's one a blog that's basically close to being a publication. It's 
a voice that's independent of a corporation or a membership organization or any entity. It's a blog that exists just to be a blog. And the content is the point of the blog rather than marketing goals or empowering your members. And it, it usually ideally strives to be the voice of a worldview or an industry or an attitude. The advantage of running an editorial blog is that you have motivated writers. They're not staff members of the company you work for who don't want to blog, or they're not um, volunteers who maybe don't have the time to blog. People join a blog that is for purely content related purposes because they like to write. So you don't have a motivation hurdle to overcome. And there are two major models for an editorial blog. One is sort of more an academic model where people are contributing really weighty, serious things that could even be a print article or something that's more journalistic or informal. But either way, you've got very motivated people writing for it. And usually people who are fairly experienced writers. So the challenges there are probably more on the technical end if they're not used to using your CMS or more on the sort of ego end of if they want to have an individual blog convincing them to be part of a team. The community blog is probably the second most popular. It's the blog of membership organizations or online communities devoted to a brand. And they're open to anybody who has an affiliation with the community. And it can be a tight affiliation, like you have to be a member. Or it can be a loose affiliation where all you have to do is register and identify yourself as being interested in marketing or World of Warcraft or cupcake recipes. Um, if it's part of a membership organization or some kind of more formal and structured organization, it's got a lot of advantages for the organization itself. It helps voices emerge within your group. So, Can everybody else hear me fine? Oh, okay. Can somebody turn that off, please? This mic in front seems to be picking me up. Oh. Yeah, we can't turn them both off. That's why we pointed one away. Oh, okay. So that's fine. Um, so if you have an online community, one of the online communities I manage is that of the American Marketing Association, and it has a community blog. And it has been a wonderful way for people who are emerging marketers within the Boston community to make their voice heard sometimes for the first time. And it's a real place where you can identify rising stars who one day will have a role in your organization. A lot of the people who right now play a great role in our organization started out as contributing to the community blog. One of the real challenges with the community blog, though, is it does require more monitoring than either a corporate blog or an editorial one because it is open to a huge number of people. Sometimes all you need to do is register and, and set up a username and password and provide your email address, and you're a member of the community and you can blog, and that makes it very vulnerable to spam or to self-promotional content or to inappropriate content. So it's one of the most labor-intensive forms of blogging because you do have to have somebody monitoring it every day because once spam starts to take control of a blog, you've got a real problem and people with quality content to contribute will stay away. So it requires vigilance, but it's a wonderful opportunity to reach out to your community of practice if you're a professional association, give people who are marketers or physicians or whatever your professional association engineers is about an opportunity to raise their voices, to emerge as leaders within your profession, and share knowledge with each other. So it gives people a wonderful opportunity to generate some user-generated content, and it provides your association with a lot of great content that will in turn attract traffic. Now on to the corporate blog. Um, it's the most common form of blog. Every company feels they need to have a blog, and they probably do, at least for SEO purposes. Um, not many people do it well. There's a tremendous number of blogs out there that are thin on content, that have promotional content, as the gentleman in the front mentioned, or that have content that's really not doing them any good from an SEO standpoint. So it is a tricky thing to do. Um, it really needs to meet marketing goals or else it's not going to be supported. It's often a marketing function. For instance, for my company, I maintain the blog and I'm also the head of marketing. So it's just one of those things where you know, it, it becomes a necessity for somebody to police it, motivate people, and get people to start blogging. It does have a lot of value, though. Um, 
it's first of all a fantastic channel and an inexpensive channel for content marketing and it can also become a customer service venue how many people right now are using your blog to interact with customers very small number of people. It's a very untapped way to interact with customers, but in fact, any social media channel is a wonderful way to interact with your customers because they feel that they can say anything and it shows transparency to your visitors. It shows that if there is a problem, you're willing to address it, and it also shows that you have people out there who are your advocates who love your company. So blogging is beneficial from both those angles as a social media channel for customer service. Um, so there are a lot of good reasons why people blog, and excuse me, I got a plug in my laptop, and I'm back. But it's also really tricky, and we'll get into some of the challenges for that. One of the first challenges is voice, and I think a bunch of folks have already talked about that. Getting people to write in a tone that's appropriate to a blog, and that can vary anywhere from people who write too formally, like for print, or write too technically, and you're really, you're marketing to your lay audience, but maybe you've, you're at a technical firm, and there are people who are writing from way up here, and you're marketing to people whose technical knowledge is here, and you have to sort of work with that and get people to understand that they have to bring the audience along with them because they might not be as technically skilled. Um, quality and consistency versus freedom of expression is a big, big issue for a community blog. In other words, do you let people have free reign to say stuff that it's, it, you know, it needs a little polish in terms of the grammar, or do you really sort of come down hard on people who are, who are trying and who's maybe whose writing style isn't something you would necessarily weep with joy to see, but they are sincere. Um, so that's really difficult. Do you, and time. Time is a huge problem for any organization, whether you are staffed by volunteers or paid staff. Usually the only person really responsible for blogging is either the marketing director or the social media manager, or if you have a community manager, they're really the only person who's got a blog. And for everybody else, they're essentially doing that person a favor if they contribute to the blog. So it's very important to have C-suite buy-in. But even then, it's going to be really, it, it's always a struggle to get people to find the time to blog. How many people here in the audience would love to have more content on your blog, but there's just no time to write it? OK, more than half the room. Um, so that's a really big, big question. The other question is the relationship between the person running the blog and the people who are blogging. Um, blog managers often wear multiple hats. Like I said, they could be the head of marketing, they could be the head of social media. They're often subordinate to the people whom they are editing, or they don't have that person in their direct line of command. So how do you, how do you manage people's writing? How do you edit people who could be your boss or who could be in somebody else's department and really not owe you any um, mind. Um, these are some of the real problems that people who are managing a multi-voice blog face on a day-to-day -day basis. So first looking at the challenges of the corporate blog. Um, first of all, why should it be multi-voice? And that's a question if you're just starting a blog program in your organization. That can be a question somebody's going to eventually ask you is why does everybody need to blog? Um, why can't marketing take care of it? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. One, it's a lot more credible if the blog posts are not coming from marketing. People, how many people here trust advertisements? Not too many. How many people believe marketing always tells the truth? Okay, that answers why a blog should not be written exclusively by marketing or by the company's senior management. Um, aside from the credibility issue, there's also the cross-functional outreach, especially if you're recruiting. Um, the, the job market is heating up and it is becoming hard to find people in certain job functions. If you give voice to the people within the departments that are hiring in your organization, that gives some transparency to potential applicants as to what it's like to work there, what the people who work there are like, and that makes it that much easier to recruit. So. One quick tip is if your organization's hiring and you're having 
you know, you're, you're coming up against the shortages that are out there, especially like in engineers, developers, certain other technical fields. Have the people who would be working alongside any candidate's blog and give people a real sense of what it's like to work there. Especially if you're a small organization and there's nothing about you out there on the web, like on glassdoor.com, so people really wouldn't have a good sense of what it's like to work with you. Blogging can really do a lot to sell your company to potential candidates. Another really good reason to have a multi-voice corporate blog is it surfaces ideas from within the company. It, it makes the whole idea pipeline more fertile within your company if you give people a chance to talk about what they're working on, what they'd like to be working on, or stuff that they just think is cool. Your, your engineering, your marketing, your accounting department might have stuff that they're doing in their spare time that's fantastic, but there's really no channel through which they can articulate that or work on it. Not every place is like Google where they give people a certain percentage of their time to work on just whatever. But the blog, the corporate blog can be a little bit of that. It gives people a chance to at least talk about close to just whatever. And it can surface the more creative side of everybody and, and bring some ideas out that eventually could be a potential money maker or a potentially new line of business for your company. On a sort of softer side, another reason why you want to have a multi-voice blog is it acknowledges and supports everybody within the company. It says, here, you have a voice within the company. You can be partly the public face of this company, and that's just so important for morale. Um, and it shows, again, to potential candidates, to potential partners, even to potential customers, that this is a passionate, committed place to work with a team who really enjoys working there and who really thinks about what they're working on, who really has a lot of knowledge. It shows that your company is passionate and committed the way a bland, sort of anonymous corporate blog does not, and keeps the blog interesting as well. The challenge with a multi-voice blog is that, again, it's seen mostly as a marketing function, and it's really hard to get people to have the inclination, time, or motivation to write. We've already talked about that. Um, content priorities can also be a little bit of a challenge, but they can usually be nailed down. And by content priorities, I mean what marketing wants to see in the blog, or what the C-suite wants to see in the blog that achieves the company's top-level goals may not be necessarily what everybody wants to blog about. And you want to have a balance of that. You want to have what's going to achieve your marketing goals, but you also want to have people be really enthused and really happy and passionate about what they're blogging about. And you need to find a balance between that. And then finally, you could be in a regulated industry where it's very difficult to get any content out, let alone something that needs to be as frequently written as a blog, because if you're in banking or healthcare, you have to really be careful what you say. So regulation can be a challenge for a lot of people, too. Um, to meet the first set of challenges, you want to set up a calendar or a spreadsheet that's going to say who's blogging, and on what schedule, sort of an editorial calendar. First off, it creates expectations. It says, OK, you only have to blog four times a year, each of you, um, and you're going to be doing it this week, this week, and this week. That way, people know what is expected of them. They know what they can get away with. They know what they can't get away with. Um, and they can work it into their schedule more so than if you just leave it nebulous and just say, hey, everybody, blog. Um, it keeps the blog on course so you never run out of content or have a ton coming in at once that you then have to sort and publish maybe two months after the person wrote it and they're waiting in the meantime to have it be published. So you keep an editorial calendar, and that helps sort of pace the rate at which people are contributing. Um, it also, having a calendar or at least nailing down what people are going to blog about as well as when they're going to blog, helps tie blogging clearly to marketing functions by joining it with your other marketing campaigns. And if you need to justify the existence of your blog or keep the blog going in some way and prove it's not just a frill, it's very crucial to do this. It's crucial to show that your blog is accomplishing something towards the higher goals of the company. And that, since blogging is considered to be a marketing function, it has to be tied to other marketing campaigns. So if in this quarter 
you're doing a campaign to promote a particular product line, you want to tie the blog to that campaign. Because that shows immediately that the blog serves a marketing purpose. It's serving the bottom line. It's not just there for people to go drawing off on. You know, It really helps show the value of the blog within the larger map of what marketing or what the company is doing as a whole. Um, it also shows people the extent of what their time commitment's going to be again, and that might be a relief to people if they're told they only have to blog a certain amount of time per year. And you might, once you realize how many people you have blogging for you, you might be able to let the people who don't like to write off the hook a lot more than you thought. You might only assign them like three or four blog posts a quarter, and it could be a tremendous relief for them. And then for people who are really awesome, you can give them a little more to do if they really enjoy it. Um, and you can balance balance it that way. And you know what, honestly, if you don't set people deadlines, this blogging is not going to work. It's just not. If people don't have a deadline to write a blog post, they probably will not write it, really, seriously. So maintain a calendar for your blog. Content priorities are another thing that you're really just going to have to work on when you have a multi-voice blog. And that but what I mean by that is, again, getting people to write the kind of content you want them to write. Getting people to write the kind of content that's going to be beneficial for the company and that's going to be appropriate for the company. You have to make them clear from the get-go. So it's, if you hold a meeting or whether you send out a memo or an email, but you have to let people know from the get-go, why are we blogging? Are we blogging to raise awareness for the company? Are we blogging to um, sell a particular product? Are we blogging to advocate for a particular viewpoint? Why are, you, why are we blogging? And you have to make sure that everybody who's contributing to the blog knows why we're blogging, what our priorities are. You want to bring them into the um, conversation and have them understand the overarching goals for the blog. Otherwise, the blog is just going to kind of wander and you know it's going to be people talking about fishing trips, which is nice and it can be charming, but at the same time you do want to have some kind of thrust and some kind of point um, for your blog. That doesn't mean, though, that every post has to be centered on the official message. In fact, if you do, it's going to sound like your blog was written by zombies. Um, you want your blog to have a personality. You want your blog to sound human. Um, if somebody wants to blog about their dog from time to time, let them do that. Nothing is going to make people stop reading your blog more than to have every single blog post be terribly serious and be about how wonderful your company is, is at making widgets. Um, another thing about being a little looser about your content priorities is, again, it can surface additional ideas from people if they're not totally constrained. But within not keeping people totally constrained and letting them be themselves, make sure that they at least understand what the purpose of the blog is, what goals it's trying to serve. Now, ghostwriting is a really sensitive issue. How many people here have ghostwritten? Small number. How many people are completely opposed to ghostwriting? Very small number. Okay, interesting. Um, from time to time, just as a practical necessity, you might have to ghostwrite blogs for people because they just don't have the time. Um, a way to avoid that if you don't want to ghostwrite is to do a simple Q&A format. Basically, sit down with people who maybe don't have the time or the inclination to write and just interview them and publish what they say as an interview. Um, in that way, you're not ghostwriting. You're, you're being very clear and transparent that this was a conversation between two people that you transcribed. Um, even if you do ultimately ghostwrite an article for people, definitely make sure that it starts as a conversation. So whether you want to sit down with your CEO or you want to sit down with a member of your engineering team and ask them some of their ideas, have a long, drawn-out conversation. Set aside an hour talk about things, and when you write the blog post for them as a ghost writer, draw on what they said and how they said it. Try to speak as closely as possible in their voice, because 
first of all, a blog is supposed to sound conversational. It's not supposed to sound formal. Second of all, if somebody walks up to somebody and says, hey, I liked your blog post, they can honestly say, oh yes, that was my blog post, without saying, what blog post? So make sure everything that every word you put into somebody's mouth actually came from their mouth and you're just writing it down rather than making stuff up out of whole cloth and putting people's names on it. Um, make sure it draws on a conversation so closely that the person you wrote it for can basically make every point in that blog post. Boy, did I put a lot of text on this slide. Um, voice and tone is another thing that you need to talk about with a um, corporate blog quite a lot with folks. And that is basically how do you get people to write in the right tone? As um, the lady in the front mentioned, it's very difficult sometimes to get people to not understand this is, you know, to understand this is not a print, printed publication and this can be a lot more casual. And at the same time, you don't want it necessarily to sound too uneven either. If you have people who sound really, really formal and then other people who have a really, really casual um, tone, if you're married to the idea of an editorial voice for your blog, it can, it can bother you. You might want to make people sound the same. Don't. Don't. It doesn't sound right if everybody in your company sounds exactly like you. In fact, it's going to become rather obvious that it's not really a multi-voice blog. It's a, it's a blog with a bunch of folks' names on it. And everyone's either been heavily edited to be on message or, in fact, it's all been ghostwritten for people. So allow unevenness of tone. Allow the guy who's wild and crazy to sound wild and crazy. Allow the people who are a little formal, as long as you make sure they do write in a blog style to sound more formal. Let people sound like themselves. Definitely go ahead, make sure things are consistent with your brand's image. I mean, you don't want people using language that they shouldn't be using. You don't want people saying stuff that's just inappropriate to your brand. But as long as people are being appropriate, care much more about whether you've got quality content, whether it's useful to the audience, whether it's serving the audience, than having everybody sound alike. You can edit people lightly, but again, just make sure it's quality content rather than trying to make people conform to a specific voice. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the editorial blog because it's, like I said, the easiest thing in the world to maintain. Um, it can be informal, which is what I like to think of as a sort of a personal blog for more than one pe person where it's, you've got maybe three or four people writing a blog for some purpose. That's, that's the easiest thing to maintain. A formal blog would be something that's closer to an online publication where you start to have formal editorial calendars, where you start to have some kind of more tight editorial oversight. Um, either way, you need to have a focus, which may or may not include a specific voice or a specific tone. But you definitely have some kind of editorial focus for your blog. Um, prior to opening up our blog at the AMA, to everybody, we had an editorial blog where there were about 12 people with different areas of specialty all blogging and we had an editorial calendar-ish sort of thing. And then we opened it up to the community. But for about a year it ran like this. Um, you really need to plan out ahead so you keep the quality of the content in terms of having it interesting, having it be lots of different bits of information. Um, you need to make sure it's planned ahead. Um, you have to make sure that people have some editorial guidelines in hand. And you have to make sure that you think about a blog that is run as a team of a small number of people as a team. You have to maintain that team cohesion. You have to make sure everybody works well together. Um, and you have to give people very high levels of autonomy. You have to trust them. You have to give them shared responsibility because basically you have handpicked a small team to write a blog with you and you want to make sure that everybody works together, feels respected, feels like their voice is heard, and works more as a coherent work team than people who are blogging for you. 
Voice is less important in an editorial blog, I think, than anywhere else because it's essentially like a publication. I mean, if you think of publications like, say, Gawker, everything there sounds the same. Whereas if you think of The New Yorker, everything sounds different. There are publications where there is a unified voice and there are publications that are open to completely wildly different tones. Both are fine. So as long as you trust your writers and you like what they write, edit as lightly as humanly possible and focus more on building your team. And for a team, it's very important to have face-to-face -face meetings, even if you're geographically dispersed, even if you can only do it once a year at a conference. Um, make sure you meet up with people as much as possible and encourage collaboration. Encourage people to share sources and ideas. Um, somebody might have a great idea, but they don't want to write it. Somebody else on the team might want to. Somebody also might have a great source you can turn to more than once. Have some kind of infrastructure for that kind of collaboration in place, whether it's an intranet, whether it's Google Plus. See, finally, there's an actual use for Google Plus. You can go home and use it now. Um, and make sure you keep on recruiting people for the team, because especially if you're not paying folks, they do tend to drop off. So maybe you want to have a community area that's opened up where you can start to recruit people from, combined format, or even if you get really good letters from your team, um, from your readers, maybe you want to recruit them onto your team. As an editor of a blog that has an editorial purpose, you want to be more of a really good sounding board, more of a sounding board than somebody who's like an enforcer of a certain type of voice. Um, depending on how much help people want or need from you, it can be intensive in the sense that you really heavily copy edit people, or you can like not edit people at all and just keep them on track with their assignments. Um, it really varies up to you as to what your time commitment is. Be aware that the more control you exercise, the more you really need regular editorial meetings, so that is something to bear in mind. Finally, we go on to the community blog, and I'm being mindful of the time. The benefits in having a community blog are they keep your members engaged. Um, they also help you kind of do a lot of market research into the community that you serve. If you're a professional organization or you're a brand, you get to give people a voice to articulate what they want from your organization. It also, if you are in a sort of professional community of practice type of situation, it gives people a chance to share their knowledge with each other. From a top-down point of view, it allows you to keep your stakeholders informed of what you're doing in a way that really, it's a little more formal than Twitter or Facebook, and yet at the same time you're not issuing press releases which don't get out and nobody reads anyway. That really helps keep your organization more transparent. If you have a blog where you talk about what's happening within your organization and you open it up to the community to comment on and discuss it, and that can be tremendously empowering for your community. And just giving people a voice who are members of your community to talk about things that are of concern to them or talk about their issues can be wonderfully empowering for them. One of the tough things about a community um, blog that's just opened up to the world and anyone can blog is that at first, nobody blogs. Nobody. You set up a blog and everyone's the afraid to be the first to dip their toes in the water. Well, the way to start getting traction and you really want to get traction as fast as possible, like in the first three months, is to start seeding some posts. Get people who are on your board, get your volunteers to write some blog posts and post them. Make sure you keep to an editorial calendar and operate as an editorial blog for as long as it takes for the blog to gain traction and start attracting posts from the community. Some of it is just on an SEO basis, you want people to start to notice the blog as it comes up in Google searches. Some of it is you just want people to get a sense of what kind of posts are appropriate or not appropriate. People want to blog, but if there's nothing there that's an example, they may not know what they should write about. So model it, have some examples. Once you have people Posting things, reinforce good posts, comment on them as the community manager, send people notes. If your um, blog is set up so that you can have a manager's choice or a featured blog post, feature the ones you like, tweet about them, post them to your organization's Facebook page or LinkedIn group. Really support and encourage your advocates early on and reach out. 
and listen. Listen a lot when your community starts blogging because you're going to start identifying issues within the community that you serve. Some problems with the um, community blog is that sometimes they can become dominated by a few really active people. There's a very... Um, very well known sort of trajectory of online community participation where you've got 90% lurkers, 1% contributors, and 9% commenters. If you want to encourage more people to join that 1%, you want to reach out beyond your current subscribers, and you want to encourage people who are first-time contributors to keep contributing. Again, we talked about some of the issues that you want to tackle are spam, self-promotion, off-topic posts, people kind of not behaving themselves. Um, not every blog has these issues, but the way to deal with them, don't censor people too heavily, but monitor them. If, put your standards for what you can and cannot do in your community in a highly visible place. Make sure people can see it. Send out reminders and just keep at it. And then maybe as a last resort, don't publish anything until somebody has looked at it, but that is very much a last resort. Um, just to sum up, for every blog, it's really important to honor different voices, communicate the goals and standards for the blog early on, offer people structure, but within that give them the freedom to talk about what they want to talk about as long as it's appropriate, keep people motivated both with praise and with schedules, and just make sure that the quality is there. Um, when you first start out, definitely just talking a little bit more about developing a strategic plan. Map out what you want to accomplish with the blog. Do you want awareness, credibility, dialogue with your community, outreach to people, and then develop a roadmap from there. Conduct an analysis if you're inheriting a blog from somebody to see what content's there and what you want to have there that isn't there. And look at what your competitors are doing and look at what the resources that you have internally are to make it happen. Um, with that, I want to thank you guys. Uh, you can reach me if you have any further questions because we're nearly we, out of time. We've got about five minutes for questions okay, if you want. Okay, that's fantastic. But if I don't get to your question, you can find me somewhere on the internet. And I blog! <laughs> uh, excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, um, second talk I've come to from you. Oh, thanks. Uh, sure. Uh, and the... My question is, when I'm setting up a, let's say, a multi-voice blog mm -hmm. or a community blog, should I make people register uh, in order to do that? Should I do it in, like, simple press, body press? Should I do it, perhaps, instead in uh, just WordPress, make, make them register through Facebook, or mm -hmm. make it completely open and, and use AccuSmith against spam? I would make people register. A um, couple of reasons for that. First of all, you've then got their email addresses so you can contact them if, you're, if you need to broadcast a message to them. And second of all, if someone's a consistent problem, if they're forced to register, you can ban them, and that can sometimes happen. And if someone's really awesome, you can communicate with them a little better. So definitely. Yes. Um, some of the people um, who saw we had a corporate blog, we mm -hmm. tried to invite them in, were from different departments. We, we run a thermal physics, a science blog. So mm -hmm. some people from accounting said, gee, could I, could I sort of blog about sort of the economic conditions as we see them? Yes. So, I mean, they were serious. It was, in mm -hmm. a, how does that work, or does it work at all in corporate blogs? We have different departments, but they're actually talking about their discipline. Is it better to set up a separate it's, it is. It's better. And if it doesn't meet your company's goals, you might need to set up a blog that's more on the personal side for people. Um, if, if you're just selling scientific instruments, I, I, I hate to tell your accounting department, but I, I don't see where your customers want to hear about accounting. Um, you might need to set up an intranet or an online community for your employees if your company's big enough to justify that to honor that kind of need. Yes, one more question. Do you reward your uh, blog team members on the corporate side? You know, do they have specific, you know, if somebody meets all their deadlines, they get this, or the, the most popular post gets X. And is there any um, financial or even soft incentive you're giving to your team members? 
Um, not financial, but definitely soft incentive. They get they get my undying thanks, um, and they don't get me standing by their desk like a like a hungry kitten on the day before their post is due, staring at them like they're eating a sandwich. So um, yes, there's carrot and there's stick. We have time for one more question. Back there. Um, should you, should, should one be worried about revealing too much? Like, you say about having the different departments come in and, you know, write things, but should we be worried about telling too much to the people that we're, you know, writing to about secrets of the company or something like that? Is that a big problem? Or? Well, definitely, if you're dealing with trade secrets, if, you're, if, you're if you have something within your company that's in development and there might be intellectual property or patent issues, um, yeah, be, be very careful. If, if you have any kind of technical issues within your company where people are working on patentable things, get your legal department to look at anything before it goes live. You do not want to leak information that's going to get to your competitors. But if you're a services company and you're a functional services company and nobody's doing anything at the Christmas party that they can be blackmailed with, don't worry about it. And um, if you are the kind of company where your parties um, are blackmailable photos, then maybe you shouldn't have a blog at all. <laughs> No, but don't worry about it unless you are dealing with things that are sensitive intellectual property. Are we done? Yep. Okay, thank you everybody. <laughs>